Good evening. Welcome once again to Revelation of Hope, our second presentation. The end is here, near or mere fear? The end, is it here, near or mere fear? That's the topic tonight. I think you're going to find it very, very interesting. And tonight, when you leave, you're going to get the outline. And for those that are watching at home, if you contact us, uh, you can, uh, we can get you the material that we're handing out here. So just let us know. We can email it to you. Uh, and uh, so to this evening, you're going to get uh, the handout material. You're going to get the overview of the Reformation, called Reformation Overview, powerful uh, video that t takes uh, six parts of, or uh, six of the great reformers uh, are presented, John Wycliffe, John Huss, uh, Martin Luther, uh, Ulrich, uh, Ulrich, um, Ulrich uh, Zwingli, John Calvin, the Anti-Baptists, and William Tyndale. So you're going to really enjoy this. And we can get you a link if you're interested. And it's, uh, you can get this. You can watch it online as well. And so we can get that link to you if you want to communicate with us. So thank you so much. We are going to, uh, Taj Paklev is going to be presenting tonight. And uh, he will have our opening prayer. God bless you as you enjoy this, the beginning of an amazing spiritual journey that we're on. Thank you, Lord, that you are our solid and stable rock. And Lord, we ask that you'd help us to be sure, very sure, that the anchor of our faith is fastened to your rock, the rock of your promises. Lord, we know that we're living in a very difficult time, a very scary world. But please, Lord, as we study your word, that as we look deeper into your prophecies tonight, we ask that your perfect love would cast out all fear from our hearts and that you would help us to draw closer to you. And may our faith be strengthened. And I pray, Lord, that you would lift our heads and lift our eyes to the hope we have in what you're doing for us right now in heaven above. Be with us now as we study, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our message is entitled, The End. Is it here, near, or mere fear? Brothers and sisters, as we consider the world in which we live in, how many of you would agree with me that we live in a very fast-paced society? I mean, compared to a hundred years ago, things have changed dr dramatically. A very fast-paced society, we are called the now generation. We're into quick fixes and get-rich-quick plans. Fast transportation, fast communication, easy relationships. All of these things in many different activities pulling us in many different directions. And the, in the busyness of life, it is important, if you want to get anything done, that is, to make sure that you manage your time wisely. And a schedule is very helpful, isn't that right? I mean, we have so many different things pulling us in so many different directions. We have deadlines and appointments and schedules and things pulling us here and there and everywhere. And friends, everything we do is dependent upon time. Is dependent upon what? And this is the same case in the spiritual realm. I want us to notice what the Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter 13 and verse 11. The apostle wrote, and that, knowing the time, that now it is a what kind of time? A high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The Bible tells us in this passage that it is important for us to know the time in which we live, to realize that right now is a high time, it is an urgent time, it is a very solemn time, not a time for us to be sleeping, but a time for us to arouse from spiritual slumber, because Jesus is coming soon. And we're going to see tonight that the end is very, very near. 
Now friends, how many of you have ever had to catch an uh, airplane that left very early in the wee hours of the morning? Have you ever had to catch one of those flights? I don't really like those ones. And if you're anything like me, you know that the only way you're going to make that flight is if you do what? Set the alarm clock. Isn't that right? And what is the purpose of the alarm as it goes off? It's to awaken you to the time that it is so that, you, so that you might get ready in the allotted time that you have. And friends, have you ever slept through an alarm? That's not a good thing, is that right? Have you ever hit that snooze button over and over and over again thinking to yourself, I just want to sleep just a little bit longer. Oh, it's so comfortable. It's so nice and warm in my blanket. And you don't want to move. It's so nice and comfortable. But friends, God has given to us in His Word some alarms so that we can wake up from spiritual slumber because we have a flight to catch, friends. A flight from earth to heaven. And the only way we're going to be ready for this flight is if we are aroused and awakened to the urgent and solemn time in which we're living in today. And so God in His infinite mercy and love has given to us signs of alarm to arouse us from spiritual slumber. But friends, unfortunately, many people are sleeping through the signs. Or worse, there are actually some individuals who wake up momentarily, they recognize the sign of the last day, and then they hit the spiritual snooze button, and they say, yes, I see that this is taking place, but let me just sleep just a little bit longer. And friends, to sleep spiritually during the signs of alarm that Jesus has given us is fatal, friends. And so I want us to notice what the Bible says in the book of Matthew, chapter 24 and verse 33. Jesus gave us signs of alarms, and I want you to notice what it is. Matthew 24, 33, please write it down. So likewise you, when you shall see, when you shall what? See. see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Jesus said that we can know that it is near, the coming, His soon coming is near even at the doors when we see these things. In other words, God has given to us some visible signs that we can see with our eyes to let us know that the end of time is very, very near. It's almost here and it's not mere fear. And so tonight we, to t so tonight we want to find out what exactly are these things that Jesus has revealed to us. What are these signs of alarms? that will arouse us from our spiritual slumber. Oh friends, how is this world going to end? We're going to see tonight, as we, co as we consider the economical, the social, the political, the natural, and the religious conditions of our world, it will become clear to us that the only logical, rational, consistent conclusion we can come to is that we are living in the last days in the time when Jesus is soon to come. And friends, if this world is going to come to an end, how exactly will it happen? Well, friends, we don't have to look into crystal balls to know the future. All we have to do is open the Word of God, and especially in the book of Revelation, it tells us how this world is going to end. Notice with me in Revelation chapter 22, God repeats something three times in this chapter, and notice what it says in verse 7. Revelation 22, verse 7, please write it down. The Bible says, Behold, I am coming how? <clears throat> quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Here Jesus in the last book of the Bible, in the last chapter of this last book of the Bible, Jesus wants us to know that he is coming and he's coming very quickly. And friends, when God says something once, it's, imper it's important the first time he says it. Can you say amen? But if he says something twice, it's very important. And he repeats this same thing again in verse 12. Notice, and behold, I am coming how? Quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. And if twice was it enough, the Lord repeats it the third time in verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, John the Revelator prays, even so come, Lord Jesus. Here we find in the last book of the Bible, the last chapter, chapter 22, God repeats thrice, three times, that He is coming quickly. He is coming quickly. And the third time it says, Surely I am coming quickly. You see, friends, the book of Revelation beats with a sense of urgency of the end of time and the second coming of Jesus. Jesus wants us to know that this event is soon to take place, but the question is, how soon is soon? How quickly is quickly? And how near is near? Because many people say, haven't Christians in every generation 
taught that Jesus was going to come in their lifetime, and yet many generations have passed off the scene and, and, and Jesus has not yet come, how do we know that we're not like all the other generations that thought Jesus would come in their life? Is it real or is it simply mere fear? to scare people into coming to church. And friends, we have to acknowledge that there have been in the Christian world doomsdayers, people who talk about the end of time with a sense of doom and gloom. There have been many people who have set false alarms and set dates of the event of the rapture and the second coming of Christ, and yet all of those predictions have failed over and over again. And so we know that there are individuals who are sincerely mistaken in setting dates concerning the coming of Christ. Many false alarms have been given, and unfortunately, these false alarms have caused people to become desensitized and calloused to the reality that Christ Jesus is soon to come. It's just like that story about, about the little boy who cried wolf. Do you remember that little childhood story? The little boy cried wolf when the wolf did not come. He gave many false alarms. But tell me, friends, did all those false alarms stop the wolf from eventually coming? Yes or no? Just because there are false alarms, the, the wolf eventually came. And in the same way, all the false alarms we hear in the, in the religious world today about the end of time and the second coming of Christ has caused people to be desensitized. But, in, but even though Jesus is still going to come, friends. In fact, notice it says in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, and verse 36, But of that day and hour, no one knows. In other words, we don't know the exact day or hour of His coming. Harold Camping and amongst others have set dates, but friends, in this seminar, we're not here to set dates. We don't know the exact day or hour, but Christ has given to us signs of alarms to let us know when it is near so that we can get ready for this grand and climactic event. And I want you to consider with me tonight that not only are religious people talking about the end of the world, but also secular humanists, people who don't even believe in God, even atheists, are acknowledging that we are living in unprecedented and scary and solemn times, even though they may not believe in the Bible. People are realizing today that our world is very different than it was just 50 years ago. And so not only are religious people talking about the end of time, but even secular humanists, but not only that, even scientific minds are talking about the end of the world. I want you to notice a few examples of this. I want you to notice, do you know who this man is? His name is Dr. Stephen Hawking. He's an astrophysicist. He currently holds the Sir Isaac Newton Chair of Mathematics at Cambridge University. He's written the, one of the number one best-selling science books entitled A Brief History of Time. And this man, Dr. Stephen Hawking, is known as the greatest scientific mind in the world today. He's known also as Einstein's successor. He's a genius, brilliant mind, a scientist, astrophysicist. But unfortunately, this genius of a mind is trapped in a debilitated body. He has Lou Gehrig's disease. He is confined to a wheelchair. He cannot speak. And he only has a little bit of movement in one of his hands and fingers. And he speaks through a voice synchronizer. And in 1997, Dr. Stephen Hawking was giving a lecture at Cornell University to a bunch of thought leaders. And he was lecturing about the future of man and the future of our world. And I want you to notice what this secular scientific mind had to say. And by the way, friends, he is an agnostic. In other words, he doesn't believe in the Bible, nor does he believe in a personal God. And notice what this agnostic, genius, scientific mind had to say about our world. He said, and, and you're wondering, well, how did he say it if he could not speak? As I mentioned, he speaks through a voice synchronizer, and this is, these were his words. He said, our long-term survival and any hope for our species is in question. However, if we can keep from destroying each other for the next 100 years, sufficient technology would develop, to notice the language, to distribute humanity to various planets. And then no one tragedy or atrocity would eradicate us all at the same time. Dr. Stephen Hawking a scientific, secular, agnostic mind, as he considered the condition of our world, he said that we're living in a very questionable time in this world's history. But his solution is science. He said if we can keep from destroying each other, then technology would develop to the point that, that we, can, we can move to different planets in our galaxy, in our solar system. So that if a tragedy or atrocity takes place on planet Earth, the human race will continue to survive on other planets. His solution to the problems of the world is science, Science is his savior, but I want to submit, friends, that we need a far greater savior than what science can offer. Can you say amen? Yes. But here's just an example 
of a secular mind talking about the end of time. Not only are religious people talking about it, but even people in the world. In fact, notice another example. A man by the name of Eugene Linden. What is his name? Eugene Linden is an award-winning journalist and author. He writes for many high-profile secular magazines like Time Magazine and New, New, uh, uh, LA Times and Wall Street Journal and National Geographic and Fortune Magazine. And he wrote a book that I have here in my hand entitled The Future in Plain Sight. He's writing from a non-religious, non-biblical view. And in this book entitled The Future in Plain Sight, uh, Eugene Linden gives nine compelling arguments of why this world can can't last uh, uh, much longer in the condition that it's in today. Nine clues to the coming instability, he says. Secular arguments why we're living in unusual and unprecedented times, reasons why this world can't last a whole lot longer. And friends, as we compare what they're saying with what the Bible says, we're going to see that they are absolutely right. Friends, the end is almost here, it's near, and it is not mere fear. In fact, I want, we're going to see tonight that the object in the mirror is closer than it really appears. Can you say amen? amen? And so here's the question. What evidence is there that we are living in the end of time? And how do we know that we're not like the other generations who thought Jesus would come but did not come? Is it possible that we will see Jesus come in our own lifetime? and with our own eyes. And friends, I believe with all my heart, absolutely yes. Now the disciples were concerned about the same questions and they asked it in the book of Matthew chapter 24. And so I invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to Matthew chapter 24 as we take a look at the signs of the times, these signs of alarm that Jesus gave concerning the end of the world. Matthew chapter 24, the whole chapter is about the last days. What is going to be like? And in this chapter, we're going to outline 12 signs. How many? 12. 12 signs of the nearness of the coming of Jesus and the last days and the end of the world. But before we look at the signs, I want us to look at the context in which Jesus gave us the signs. So notice with me, we're in Matthew chapter 24, beginning with verse 1. We're going to stay here for the rest of our time tonight. Matthew 24, verse 1. If you're there, and if you're ready to study, would you please say amen? amen. Alright, let's go. Matthew 24, 1 says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Here the disciples were wanting to show Jesus the beautiful temple there in Jerusalem. And as Jesus looks upon the pride and joy of the Jewish nation, the, the temple of the Lord, he begins to prophesy that this temple will be leveled to the ground, that it would be completely destroyed. And friends, you have to understand when the disciples heard that prophecy, they were shocked. They couldn't believe it. They could not imagine life without the temple there in Jerusalem because you see friends, this temple, as I mentioned, was the pride and the joy of the Jewish nation. Their identity was wrapped up in that temple. It was a beautiful temple. It was one of the ancient wonders of antiquity. It, was, it had gold and precious stones and all types of things that made it so beautiful. Their identity was wrapped up in it. And so these disciples could not imagine life without the temple. And so notice what happens in the next verse, verse 3. They begin to inquire about what Jesus means about the temple being destroyed. Notice verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What things do you think they're referring to contextually? What are they asking about? They're asking about the destruction of the temple. When will our beautiful temple be destroyed? When shall these things be? And then notice, and what shall be the sign of thy what? Coming and the end of the what? End of the world or end of the age. You see friends, the disciples were asking two questions about two different events, but they were asking it in the same context. You know why? Because these disciples felt that the only way this temple would be destroyed is at the very end of time, at the second coming of Jesus Christ. As I mentioned, they couldn't imagine life without the temple. 
They thought that these two separate events, the destruction of the temple and the destruction of the world at the end of time, had to be fulfilled in the same event. But in response to these questions, Christ with a masterful presentation answered both questions in the same answer by blending the signs of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem with the signs that would take place at the end of the world in the last days. Now why do you think Jesus did that if he knew that they would happen in two different time periods? Here's the reason. The signs that surrounded the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem back in those times was to be a microcosm. It was to be a what? Or a physical object lesson to teach you and I about what would happen at the end of time in the last days. In other words, what happened to Jerusalem on a small national scale would be repeated at the end of time on a much larger, grander international scale. And some of you might wonder, well how does the destruction of the temple parallel end time events? This is how it parallels. I want you to notice in verse, verse 14. The Bible tells us, in fact, let's read verse 13. In Matthew 24, 13, Jesus said, And he that shall endure unto the when? The end, the same, shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Notice verse 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by who? Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Let, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall there be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time no, nor ever shall be. And so here we find Jesus is paralleling the destruction of te the temple in Jerusalem to what's going to happen at the very end of time. And he told the disciples, when you see Jerusalem about to be destroyed, recognize that this is a fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. Of whose prophecy? Daniel. When you see it happen, re realize that this is what Daniel wrote about. And so read Daniel, and whoso readeth, let him understand. And the ones who understood the prophecy are the ones who recognized the fulfillment of it. And when they saw the fulfillment of it, they knew exactly how to respond. They would flee to the mountains for their life. And that's exactly what took place. This event of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem happened in the, in the year A.D. 70. Titus and the Roman armies invaded Jerusalem. But just before destroying the city, God gave his people a chance to flee. Those who knew the prophecy recognized the sign and they fled. And as a result, they were saved from the terrible destruction in Jerusalem. But those who ignored the sign or did not know the prophecy, they didn't see the fulfillment of it. And therefore, they remained in that city. They didn't know what to do. And the... Uh, uh, the Jewish historian Josephus says that in that terrible siege, not less than one million people died in that siege. But not one person who understood prophecy and responded to it was lost in that terrible siege. Can you say amen? amen. And so what's the point? Those in that time who understood prophecy were saved because they knew how to respond when they saw the fulfillment of it. And in the same way, those in the last days who know Bible prophecy, they're going to recognize the fulfillment of it when they see it. And because of that, they're going to know how to respond to it. And they will be able to spare themselves of terrible destruction and desolation in these last days. Can you say amen? And so in light of this context, tell me, friends, do you think it's important to understand Bible prophecy, yes or no? Yes. Oh, friends, how important is it? It's a matter of eternity. And no wonder why Satan works so hard to try to stop us from studying the contents of Bible prophecy. You see, friends, it's very important. Because if we don't know it, we won't see the fulfillment of it. If we don't see the fulfillment of it, we're not going to know what to do. But praise the Lord, bless God, He has shown us these things to arouse us from spiritual slumber so that we can make good use of the time that He's given us. Can you say amen? And so that's the context. Now let's take a look at the signs that Jesus gives. The first sign is signs in the religious condition of our world. You can write it down. False Christs and false prophets in the last days. Let's read it now. Matthew 24, beginning with verse 4, the Bible says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man do what? 
Oh, help me out tonight, friends. Verse 4 of Matthew 24. Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Then Jesus repeats it in verse 11. Notice verse 11. It says, and many, false cro- uh, excuse me, and many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And then notice verse 24. He repeats it the third time. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Jesus repeats three times in this chapter. Beware of deception in the last days. In the last days there will be false Christs and false prophets performing signs and wonders and miracles intending to deceive people. In other words, Jesus is describing a world where there's an explosion of interest in false religious teachings. He's describing spiritual leaders straying away from the Bible and leading people away from the true faith of Jesus. And friends, we've seen our fair share of false Christs and prophets in these last days, haven't we? Remember what happened? With Marshall Applewhite and the Heaven's Gate cult, he was a leader that had false teachings about the end of time. And as a result, over about 39 individuals committed suicide because they believed in the words of a man. They thought that he was a prophet. He taught that the hale Bob Comet was actually a flying saucer. And that, that, fl- that flying saucer was coming to take the people to the next level. And in order to link them with that saucer, they had to take their lives and commit suicide. And that's exactly what 39 people did. And by the way, this happened in Rancho Santa Fe near San Diego, California. And friends, Rancho Santa Fe is the highest income community in the United States of America. In other words, these were not crazy people that did this. They were intellectual people. People with scientific minds, wealthy people. And so we see that wealth and and, and intellect, it does not make a person immune from deception of Satan in the last days. Isn't that right? We also remember the story of Jim Jones in the, in, in the 70s. The largest mass suicide in United States history took place because people believed a man's word above the word of God. Jim Jones, the founder of the People's Temple, which was a loving and charismatic church in San Francisco. In fact, former Vice President Walter Mondale visited Jones, Jones's ministry and praised Jones publicly for being a great civic leader. They would have healing and miracle services in his church. They began with the Bible, but eventually he began to replace it with his own ideas, his own teachings, and as a result, over 900 sincere people were sincerely deceived. They followed him to the jungles of Guyana, and as a last act of devotion to him whom they thought was another Christ, a prophet, they drank the deadly drink. Mothers gave poison to their little infant children. Why? Because they believed in the words of a man instead of the words of God. Friends, we're seeing this prophecy being fulfilled in our day and age. We see false religious revivals taking place all around the world. Occultic and false religious groups. We see in newspapers across America over 3,000 astrology columns every single day. Occultic books selling by the millions. Countless websites and hotlines advertising psychic readings. This explosion of interest in false religion confirms Jesus' prophecy to be true that we're living in the very end of this world's history. But I'm so grateful that Jesus gave us his word to set us free from the demonic deceptions of Satan. Can you say that? Friends, as long as you stick to the Bible, you're going to be safe. Now Jesus gives us signs in the international condition and relations of the world. Notice the next sign. Number two is wars and rumors of war. Notice what it says in verse, in verse 7. The Bible says, actually verse 6 and 7. It says, And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse or various places. So now Jesus describes the condition of the political and social international relations of the world. And he says that this world is going to experience wars and rumors of wars. Now friends, listen, we've always had wars from the beginning of time. But this is wars in the plural. In other words, Jesus is describing a world that is engulfed in war. And let me remind you, friends, that the 20th century was the bloodiest century of it all. We've experienced international conflict on a global scale. In other words, world wars. In the past century, we've had two world wars. The Vietnam War, the Korean War, 
the Indochina conflict, Iran and Iraq, conflicts in the Middle East, tribal conflicts in Africa. We've seen revolutions just in the last five or six years in Syria, Jordan, Libya, Egypt, Yemen, Arabia, all causing the death of countless millions. In fact, sociologists have estimated that in the 20th century alone, there have been 180 million deaths from war. And friends, that is a very sad and sobering statistic. And in our day and age, we've also seen a new type of war that is not fought on battlefields now, but is taken to the streets of our beloved cities in, in our country. Terrorism, friends. And now the victims are no longer men in uniform, soldiers, but now they're innocent bystanders like women and children. And friends, we all remember where we were when we saw these scenes take place before our eyes. It's very sad, friends, the world that we're living in. Jesus said that this is exactly what it's going to be like in the last days. And friends, as man makes plans for peace, it seems like more wars break out. In fact, notice what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 3. The Bible says, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, and they shall not escape. Here we find the Bible prophesying of, of times of peace and safety followed by intense sudden destruction. And how many times have we seen peace treaties fail in the Middle East over and over again? Mankind is crying out, peace and safety, but all of man's plans for peace and safety do not work, friends. And so sign number three that we're living at the end is failed plans for peace. You see, all the efforts of the United Nations have failed in bringing lasting world peace. True peace will not come until the Prince of Peace comes in the clouds of heaven. Can you say amen? And I want us to notice, friends, how destruction, how the Bible said destruction would come. It said it would come very suddenly. It would come how? Suddenly. Now, friends, never before in the history of our world has the human race had the ability or the capacity to destroy ourselves very rapidly and very suddenly with weapons of mass destruction. You see, back in the day, wars were fought on battlefields with guns and cannons. But nowadays, wars are fought with men sitting behind desks, pushing buttons. And entire cities and countries can be destroyed in an instant, friends. Another great fear in our day and age is biological and chemical warfare. We're living in a very dangerous world today, friends. So dangerous that the 20th century scientists and journalists, Sir Charles Snow said, we know of certainty with, of statistical truth that if enough of these weapons are made by enough states, some of them are going to blow up through accident, folly, or madness. And friends, that's a sad reality to consider. But I'm so grateful that we don't have to be afraid. Amen? Amen? Even though we live in a scary world, we don't have to be afraid of a madman dropping a bomb on these beautiful islands. You see, God does not want us to live in fear. And while millions of people are gripped with fear and are not able to sleep peacefully at night, you and I who know the blessed Christ can sleep like a baby with the calm assurance that yes, this world is crazy and it's going to come to an end, but we have the hope of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Another sign that Jesus gave that we're at the end is something that hits all of us, economic instability. Does that sound familiar to you? Financial crises happening in, the, happening in the last days. And we go to the book of James to find this prophecy in James chapter 5, verse 2 and 3. The Bible says, Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will te testify against you, and eat your flesh like fire. For you have hoarded wealth in the what days? In the last days, the Bible tells us that in the last days, the wealth of the land will become rotted, it will become corrupted. In other words, the money will lose its value. That's inflation, friends. So much so that Revelation chapter 18 verse 17 tells us, For in one hour such great riches came to what? It's describing a financial collapse, an economic downturn. You see, for many years in the United States of America, gold was the backing, it was the standard of the American dollar. But the gold standard was removed many years ago. And friends, now if the government needs more money, they just print it out. And friends, any financial expert knows that when a, a, a government just prints out money, that is economic suicide. Our national deficit, over $16 trillion. Can you imagine that, friends? 
rising billions of dollars every single day and as a result millions of people losing their jobs and their homes it's a financial crisis friends and perhaps this crisis is your own personal crisis maybe you're struggling to pay the rent and pay the mortgage maybe you're even losing your home even as we speak today well friends I have good news for you and that is that in heaven there is no such thing as foreclosures can you say amen in heaven the rent is cheap it's free. Amen. Jesus paid it with his own blood. Can you say amen? amen? And so while we may struggle financially in this world, don't worry friends, you have a mansion in heaven with your name on it. Amen. And the Bible tells us that God will provide for all of our needs. And that's why it's so important for us to store our treasures up in heaven. You see, everything is going to burn in this world, friends. We can't take anything in this world to heaven with us. There are only two things we can take to heaven. How many? And you know what that is? Your character and the people you win to Jesus. Therefore, everything we have, everything we do, we ought to invest in building up a character like Christ and to share Jesus with others because these are the only two things in this world that's going to last forever. Our character and our converts, the ones that we bring to the Lord Jesus. And if you are struggling financially, I invite you to claim the promise of God. Bible says, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. You see, friends, worry is blind. Don't worry, because it blinds you. Worry is blind and cannot discern the future. But our God has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know not. All we have to do is trust in Him, put our faith in Him, follow Him, obey Him. And friends, He's going to take care of us. The Bible says in Psalms 23 verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In other words, God will provide our, for our needs as long as we choose to be a sheep and follow the great shepherd wherever He leads. King David said, I was young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed, his offspring, his children begging for bread. And so friends, you can rest assured that while God may not always give you everything you want, he will always provide for all of our needs as long as we continue to trust him. Can you say amen? amen. And then after that, we have all of the heaven to look forward to together. I hope you're encouraged tonight. Keep trusting the Lord. God is going to take care of you. I want you to notice Jesus also describes that in the last days, the economic instability, the financial collapse will result in people not having enough food. He said there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Famine meaning that there's not enough food and friends the United Nations reported recently that there is a food shortage in over 40 countries of the world. They also said that one-sixth of the world's population is undernourished and they also said that 10,000 people die every single day. 3.5 million people every single year. Why? Because they don't have enough food to eat. And so sign number five that we're living in the last days is famine on a global and international scale. And friends, for this cause, we ought to thank God every single time we sit at a meal. Thank God for giving to us our daily bread. Can you say amen? And not take anything for granted and as much as we can to share our bread with those who are less fortunate than us. And by the way, friends, another major factor that is causing international famine is also the world's population growth. And friends, this is one of the other reasons why Jesus must come very soon and that, that this, this world can't last another hundred years. You see, the world population growth has grown exponentially in, in, in the past 30 years. If, if you notice, up, up into the 1800s, it's been pretty, pretty steady and even. And I want you to notice these statistics. It took about 5,000 years to get the first billion people on planet Earth. But then to get the second billion people, it only took 123 years. Now friends, tell me, is there a big difference between 5,000 and 123 years? Do you see how it just shot up exponentially? And then it only took 33 years to get the third billion people. And then only 14 years to get the fourth billion people. Now friends, I like people, but there's a problem with this. The way in which our world is run cannot sustain this amount of life. Because what happens is, as the population increases, farmland decreases. And friends, you can't grow food from pavement, can you? 
And so whenever the population increases and farmland decreases, what do you have? You have famine on an international scale. And friends, no politicians are really talking about this. You know why? Because there's no good solution to it. But some elite of the world are talking about population reduction which is a very scary thing to consider. And friends, as population increases and farmland decreases, what also increases? Pollution and waste. We're destroying ourselves with our extravagant lifestyles. And the Bible tells us in Isaiah 51 verse 6 that the earth will grow old like a garment. And that's exactly what we're seeing here today. Our earth is getting old and cancerous. And the increase of pollution and unsanitary conditions are a breeding ground for the next sign Jesus gave. Sign number six, he said not only famines, but pestilences in, in the world. And friends, what are pestilences? There are new and unusual diseases. And friends, we've seen our fair share of pestilences increasing in, these re in recent times, haven't we? With SARS and mad cow disease and the bird flu and the Ebola virus and, and, and swine flu, etc. Rare diseases with no cures would, would, would intensify. And Jesus also said that there's going to be earthquakes in diverse or various places. The world is going to be shaking all the time. And some of you might be wondering, how can these things be signs of the last days when we've always had these things from the very beginning of time? People say we've always had earthquakes. There's always been famine in history. There's always been war. There's always been false doctrine and deception. And so how can we say that these things are signs of the end when every generation had experienced similar things? Oh, friends, the fact that Many people are, 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 are so skeptical about it, in itself is a sign. I want you to notice what the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. The Bible says, There shall come in the last days, what? Scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. You see, the Bible tells us that there will be scoffers, skeptics in the last days who will say this world is the same as, as it was from the very beginning of time. Jesus is not coming soon. The end is not near. It's just mere fear. Well, friends, I want, I want you to know that the Bible tells us in verse 8 why these things are signs of the end. Notice what it says in verse 8. Immediately after Jesus described earthquakes and pestilences and famines and wars, notice what he said in verse 8, Matthew 24. All these are the beginning of what? of sorrows. Now friends, do you know what that word sorrows is in the original Greek? It's the word birth pains. And do you know what a birth pain is? It's a labor contraction. In other words, these signs are like labor contractions. Now I'm a man and my wife and I don't have kids yet, but you mothers out there, do you know something about labor contractions? Have you, ever, have you experienced this before? What is the characteristic of a labor contraction? How does it start at first? It starts mild and far apart. Isn't that right? But as the baby gets closer to being born, tell me mothers, do those labor contractions change? How do they change? In two ways. They increase in intensity and frequency. Isn't that right? You see, these signs are like labor contractions. We've always had these from the very beginning of time. But these are signs of the end when we see these same things increasing in its intensity and its frequency. When we see wars and rumors of wars, famines and pestilences and earthquakes and natural disasters, friends, are earthquakes and natural disasters increasing in intensity and frequency? Yes. Friends, I want you to notice some of these statistics. Major recorded earthquakes from the 9th century on that were equal to 7 plus on the Richter scale. In the 9th century, there was only one major recorded earthquake that was greater than 7 plus on the Richter scale. From the 10th to the 15th century, zero. The 16th century, there was one. 17th, none. 18th, two. 19th, one. But the 20th century, how many? 19. Friends, is that a huge difference? In fact, just in the past 100 years, it is, uh, we can see a dramatic change in the last 10 years. The United States Geological Survey, this is the official 
website of the United States that tracks earthquakes all around the world. You can go online and see it for yourself. And they've traced the, uh, some major, the number of, uh, of major earthquakes that is between the magnitudes of 6 to 8 on the Richter scale in the last 100 years from the 1900s on. And if you notice, for the, up until about the year 2000, it's been just a little bit more than five, maybe around six major recorded earthquakes in every year from that time. But in the last 10 or so years, it jumped up to about 30. Friends, is that a huge difference, yes or no? There's a lot of shaking taking place, like birth pains. These same signs are increasing in its intensity and frequency, and not just earthquakes, but tsunamis, wildfires, hurricanes, tornadoes, and all of these things, floods and, and whatnot, destroying the lives of, of countless millions of people all around the world. Friends, it seems like Mother Nature is having birth pains. She's going into convulsions, friends. Mother Nature wants us to know that we can't live here much longer. Soon Jesus is going to be, is going to come back into this world, not like he did the first time as a humble babe, but he's coming as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Can he say amen? amen. And so we find sign number six or sign number seven of the end of time is that we will see natural disasters increasing in its intensity and frequency. And now Christ moves to the social and the moral condition of the world in the last days. He likened it to that of Noah's day. Notice what the Bible says in Matthew 24 verse 37. But as, but as in the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, just as it was in Noah's day, so shall it be in the last days. Well, what was it like in Noah's day? Notice what it says in Genesis chapter 6. Verse 5 and 6. The Bible says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only what? Not good, only evil. And then add the word, adds the word, continually. You see, the time, during the time of Noah, it was wicked, it was evil, it was corrupt. In fact, notice what it says in verses 11 and 12. It says, And the earth was also uh, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence, and God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Notice the descriptions of Noah's day. It was wicked, evil, corrupt, and violent, and this is a fit description of our world today, friends. Violence and hate fills the streets of our beloved country, and many people are inventing more and more ways to do evil instead of doing good. Schools are becoming battlegrounds for gang violence, and people are no longer valuing the sanctity of human life life we live in an unsafe and a very scary place you see there's not a lot of people we can trust nowadays friends it's just like it was in Noah's day US News and World Report ran an article where they said this Disp disputes once settled with fists between kids are now settled with guns every hundred hours more youths die in the streets they were killed in the Persian Gulf warfare and friends that's very sad Instead of duking it out, they're, they're shooting one another. That's what's taking place, friends. Oh, what a scary world we live in. And friends, I want you to notice the contrast of the problems that, that faculty and teachers in high school had in the 1940s compared to the 1990s. The major problems in the 1940s, do you remember what it was? Those of you who were around back then? The major problems that faculties and teachers faced from their, from their students was talking out of turn, chewing gum, making noise in class, running in the hall, cutting in line, dress code infractions, and littering. These were the major issues in the 1940s. But friends, what about the 1990s? What are the major issues? Drug use, pregnancy, alcohol abuse, rape, robbery, assault, and suicide. Friends, tell me, in these two columns, is there a huge difference, yes or no? A huge difference. The wickedness is intensifying, friends. It's getting worse and worse and worse. And that's exactly what the Bible says would happen. Notice in 2 Timothy 3.13 it says, But evil men and, and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And friends, yes, littering. It's, it, it's not bad at all, is it? In comparison to the problems we're facing today. 
assault and robbery and rape are terrible things, but friends, we think it can't get worse. And remember in Columbine, when those young men went into the high school and shot their classmates and teachers in cold blood and it just shook the nation. You see, children nowadays no longer have to worry about the playground bully. Now they have to worry about crazy men with guns breaking into the schools. And when we saw this, we thought, oh, we can't get any worse than this. But it actually got worse. In 2007, on, at Virginia Tech University, that crazy gunman, this was the largest massacre uh, in United States history in a school where he shot over 33 people in cold blood for no reason, friends. He shook the nation. And friends, we thought it couldn't get worse, but it, it got worse this past December. Well, we see now it's not just universities and high school, but even elementary schools where these 21st graders shot in cold blood. Oh, friends, can you imagine? Let me tell you, all human life is valuable. But when it comes to little innocent children, how much worse can it get, friends? When I heard this news, I wept bitterly because I was thinking about my little brother who's, who, who is just the same age. Oh, friends, we live in a scary and a terrible world. And my prayer was, Lord Jesus, come, please, come and take us home already. This world is a crazy world. The Bible tells us in Matthew 24, verse 12, And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow what? And friends, we live in a very cold and calloused world today. And therefore, sign number eight that we're living in the end of time is violence filling our lands just as it was in Noah's day. And then Jesus describes what's going to happen in the last days. In fact, notice what it says in Luke chapter 17, verse 28. Write it down. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the last days. Well, what was it like during Lot's day, during the time of Sodom and Gomorrah? In Jude, in verse 7, write it down. The Bible tells us that the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were given over to sexual immorality. In other words, that when it says that they were given over to sexual immorality, that means they were totally controlled by perversity, friends. And this is a fit condition of our world today. We see it everywhere. In the media, in the movies, in billboards, in magazines. You see, Sodom and Gomorrah was known for its sexual perversity, doing things that not even animals would do, that which is totally against nature, defiling the temple of God. And friends, today in our day and age, we've lost the respect and sanctity of marriage and society is becoming more and more permissible to what the Bible calls an abomination. And so sign number nine is that sexual perversity and sexual immorality will control our world today. And friends, this is indeed what our world is like. Friends, I want you to notice the divorce rate and how it shot up. In, in, the, in the beginning of the 1900s, there was one divorce out of every 12 marriages. But friends, how much is it today? One divorce out of every two marriages. That is a very sad statistic. They say, in fact, it gets even worse. People say that five out of every ten marriages will end in divorce. And the five that stay together, they say four out of the five are miserable. And only one out of the original ten truly has a happy home. We find Satan attacking marriage like never before. And friends, as there is an increase of divorce, there is also a decrease in marriage. I want you to notice a 30% decrease in marriage. And if that's the case, surely there will be a decrease in divorce. But we see that that's not the case. There's a 40% increase in divorce. And births to unmarried women in the United States are rising higher and higher and higher. And as a result, what do we have? Children who grow up in imbalance and dysfunctional homes. And without seeing the ideal relationship demonstrated before their eyes, they are prone to make the same mistakes of their parents, but they make it worse and worse and worse. And the cycle of dysfunction repeats over and over and over and over again. You see, friends, Satan hates marriage. He hates the family. He wants to break us up. And perhaps this evening, you find yourself a part of this terrible and sobering statistic. Oh, friends, I want to give you hope tonight. That no matter how bad your home life may be, God is in the business today of restoring homes, marriages, families, and lives. Can you say amen? amen? God is in the business of restoration. He can restore peace in your household. 
Maybe you are a single parent. Why don't you know that the Bible says that God is the God of the fatherless. He is the judge of widows. He can make up the absence in your household. Maybe your marriage is shaky. Well, friends, Christ wants to restore the love and the respect that the devil has stripped from your marriage. Or maybe you've already gone through a devastating divorce. Or, oh, friends, Jesus wants to heal your heart and teach you to move on in life. Let the past be past. He wants you to learn to love and trust once again. And, friends, I know this from personal experience. Because I grew up in a broken home. You see, I was an accident. I wasn't planned. I was born... By two, uh, I, was, I was born in a family that my parents were not married. They were not a Christian family. It was not a Christian family. And growing up, I had no idea what was God. And sometimes I would live with dad. Other times I would live with mom. I was back and forth. And friends, my parents, it seemed like they hated each other. There was animosity. There was conflict in my home. And they were separated most of my life. I know what a broken home is like, friends. But when I was 16 years old, Someone invited my mother and I to a Revelation seminar. Amen. And we heard how Jesus saves. We heard the beautiful gospel truth that Jesus restores. And God got a hold of my life and he got a hold of my mom's life. And enabled my mom to learn to love and trust my dad. And so after 16 years of living in a broken, separated home, my mom and dad actually got back together and they actually got married for the first time. And then about three years after that, and after 19 years of being the only child, baby brother comes upon the scene. Here's my family today, friends. It's not a perfect home, but it was a lot better than what it used to be. I'm here to tell you, friends, if Satan is attacking your marriage and your household, God can restore it. He's did it for mine, and he can do it for yours tonight. Maybe you're struggling with sexual sin and perversity. I want you to know that there is hope for you. Jesus can give you victory. He can wash you clean. You see, the blood of Christ is the best detergent. It's the Clorox to cleanse every stain of sin upon the garment of our lives. And though we have made mistakes in our past, Jesus wants to wash it all away, give us a clean slate, a brand new beginning. And Jesus, brothers and sisters, not only cleanses us of the mistakes of the past, but he gives us power to live a victorious life in the present. Listen, friends, the Lord Jesus can give us victory over our inherited as well as cultivated tendencies to evil. We need not be a slave to the genes that we were born in, friends. Christ wants to give us a brand new nature. Can you say amen? amen. And there's hope in Jesus today. I hope you're encouraged, friends. God wants to restore your family, your relationships. He can do it. But it starts with you as an individual making a decision for yourself that God comes first. That your relationship with the Lord is more important than any other earthly relationship. And friends, when Jesus is in the center of your life, all things begin to fall into place. The Bible says in Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. What things? Everything that you need in life will be provided as long as you seek Him first. And we can take that promise to the bank. It's going to, it's going to cash in. Can you say amen? amen? I want you to notice before we close, the Bible gives us three last signs. In Ma and now we go to the book of Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4 to discover these signs. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4, the Bible tells us, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Well, what is it going to be like in the time of the end? It continues. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be what? So the Bible tells us in this passage that at the time of the end, many people are going to be running to and fro. In other words, people are going to be moving here and there and everywhere. And friends, this is a reality of our world today. Thousands of people board planes every single day. We can span our globe in airplanes and even leave our, our solar system in, in spaceships and, and, and shuttles. And friends, this is significant. You know why? Because for thousands of years, horseback was the only method of transportation. But in recent years, there are so many other different methods. Cars and trains and buses and planes, all of these things testify to the reality that we're living at the end of time, which is sign number 10. 
an increase of travel, people running to and fro all over the world. And then the Bible tells us that knowledge shall be increased. And friends, we're living in a very, uh, a very knowledgeable age. We're living in a scientific age. And friends, knowledge is increasing. Did you know that about 80% of all scientists that ever lived are alive today? Because of technology, we have things that have been denied uh, kings of the past. Every time we jump on the computer, at, at every click of the mouse, there, there's an explosion of knowledge, information at our fingertips right before our very eyes. And so sign number 11 that we're living in the last days is that knowledge would be increasing and intensifying very rapidly. Now friends, the knowledge that this is referring to in Daniel chapter 12 is not just scientific and technological knowledge, but contextually it's knowledge of Bible prophecy, which leads us to our last sign, sign number 12 that we're living in the last days, is that the gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached in all the world. Notice what Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in how much of the world? All the world for a witness unto how many nations? All nations. And then what's going to happen? And then shall the end come. Here we find, friends, that one of the last signs of the coming of Jesus is that this gospel of the kingdom is going to be given throughout the whole world. And the reason why God is going to give the gospel to the whole world before the end comes is because God so loved the world. He is not willing that any should perish. He wants all to have an opportunity to be ready for the end, the second coming of Christ. And friends, through the means of technology, media, and the internet, the gospel message of Christ is able to go where missionaries are forbidden to go. In Islamic nations, people are discovering the gospel on the internet. You see, all around the world, all around the globe, God is on the move, friends. He's working intensely, getting the good news out there. Come with me to Africa. I've been there a few times. I did a meeting in a town in Tanzania. The town's population was 98% Muslim. And we held a meeting in that town and hundreds of people, you can see them right there, hundreds of people came to those meetings hearing the gospel and over 400 people were baptized at those meetings. Friends, all around the world, God is on the move. Can you say amen? amen? And come with me to India as well. I've been there. India is a country that for many years was very resistant to the gospel. They believed in many, many gods. And missionaries would work in India for decades and only win maybe one or two souls for Christ. But in recent time, there has been an explosion of interest in Christianity there in this country called India. Over 100,000 people being baptized, giving their hearts to Jesus all around the world, friends. God is on the move. Can you say amen? And friends, what he's doing in other third world countries, he wants to do right here in the United States of America, right here in the beautiful islands of Hawaii. And it's up to us if we want to be a part of it, to let the Lord use us to share the good news message with our neighbors and our community. Can you say amen? amen. And so tonight as we begin to close, we've looked at 12 signs of the last days. What are these signs? Let's review. False Christ and false prophets. We've also seen Jesus describing wars and rumors of wars, failed plans for peace, economic instability, famines and pestilences. We've also seen natural disasters, violence filling our lands, sexual immorality, an increase of travel, knowledge increasing, and number 12, the gospel going throughout the whole world. And these 12 signs, like labor contractions, are increasing in intensity and frequency, and thus the logical, rational, intelligent conclusion we come to tonight is that the end of time is very near it's almost here and it's not mere fear can you say amen? amen the only solution to the problems of our world is the second coming of Jesus Jesus you see brothers and sisters no politician or political party has the answers to the problems that we're, our world is facing free health care is not going to stop disease and death Bearing arms are not going to keep people safe. Welfare is not going to stop hunger and homelessness. National security will not stop the conflict and the chaos. And making more laws is not going to stop the lawlessness in our world. The only solution to the pollution, the only answer to the cancer of our world is the coming of Jesus. Amen. And friends, I'm, I'm glad that he's coming soon. Amen? Amen. And as we close tonight, how shall we respond? to the coming of Jesus. How shall we respond to these 12 signs that we're seeing all around us? This is what Jesus wants us to do. Notice what the Bible says in Luke 21 verse 28, my last scripture. The Bible says, now when these things begin to happen, what things? The signs. 
It says, when you see these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. In other words, friends, God wants us to look around so that we can see the signs and recognize the fulfillment of prophecy. But don't look horizontally. Don't focus on the signs. Don't focus on the problems. Instead of focusing on the signs, look up and focus on the Savior. Because friends, you can know all the signs and still be lost. But if you know the Savior, you will not be lost. Amen? Amen. And so when we look around, we see the crazy, chaotic world we live in. We see that it's a scary world. And friends, we're prone to get depressed when we look around. When you look at yourself and your circumstances and this life, you get depressed and discouraged. And therefore Jesus says, look up, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And when you do, the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. So friends, I invite you to look up. Lift up your eyes. Focus on Christ. Yes, look around, but only momentarily to see the signs. But then quickly keep your eyes on Jesus. He's coming soon. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing in this seminar for the next few weeks. We're going to be looking up and looking within the Word of God. Asking the Lord Jesus to make us ready for the second coming of Christ. And friends, as we close tonight, how many of you want to say, Lord, make me ready for your return? Is that your prayer? If so, I invite you to bow your heads as we close tonight. Lord, we thank you so much for helping us through this very practical message. You've given us signs of alarm. Please forgive us, Lord, for sleeping through the alarms. Please forgive us, Lord, for the times that we've hit the spiritual snooze button. Please forgive us for being so comfortable in our complacency, so lazy and so spiritually calloused. Father, I pray that you put in our hearts a sense of urgency, a sense of solemnity of the time in which we live. And help us, Lord, to make every moment count for eternity. Lord, in the decisions we make from day to day, help us to make every decision, every choice with the end in mind. And Father, we thank you that even though we live in a scary world, we need not be afraid. But all we have to do is look up, for our redemption draws nigh. All we have to do, Lord, is learn to love you. And you have promised that perfect love will cast out fear from our hearts. And so, Lord, teach us to focus on the love of Jesus and make us ready for your coming is our humble prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Let all of God's people say, Amen. I think we're offline. We're off, right? We're not being broadcasting now? Yes. We are or not? No. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Okay. We still streaming? Yes. Okay. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed the presentation tonight. Uh, it's an awesome presentation, and this is an awesome series, and we are going to have more. In fact, tomorrow night is the end of this week's three uh, part series and next week we'll continue on uh, superpowers of prophecy and that's going to be next Friday night and then the Lamb of Revelation and that's Saturday evening and then why does a loving God allow sin and suffering a very important topic that confuses a lot of people and turns a lot of people away from God because they just think if God's a loving God why could this happen so what does the Bible say that's going to be very good that'll be next Sunday as well and then it's going to continue on even after that. So you can just really, really, really enjoy uh, this journey of faith. Share it with your friends. If you're watching online, you can certainly um, invite your friends to uh, go on, on, the, on the website or go on the YouTube and, and watch and enjoy as well. God bless you all. Have a safe journey home. Let's just ask the Lord to bless. Heavenly Father, thank you tonight for this amazing presentation. We are in the last days without any question and you're coming soon. But as, as uh, uh, Brother Taj said, he said, don't look horizontally. Don't look at all the problems. 
we see the problems, we recognize the problems, but help us, Lord, to keep our eyes looking up because our redemption draws nigh. So help us to keep our eyes on Jesus, our wonderful Savior and soon coming King. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Safe journey home.